A new beginning is waiting for anyone who is willing and wanting to make Jesus Christ the Lord of their life. Our scripture text comes from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. And the word of God reads as this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, to the hearing, and now let us prepare to get an understanding of God's word. The scripture says, therefore, if any man, we can stop right there, any man, any man or any woman, any man, it does, not, it does not matter your nationality, it does not matter your ethnicity, any man be in Christ. He is a new creature. Some translations say new creation. Some translations say new beginning. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So church, in order for us to be a new creature, in order for us to be a new creation, in order for us to be in a new beginning, then we have to be in Christ. Amen? Now, here is my question, church. What does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean to be in Christ? Anyone? To be in Christ? Believe in him. Believe in him. Amen. Walk in the Lord. Amen. Believe, do his word. Amen. Obey his word. Amen. Believe in him. Do his word. Obey his word. So if we are in Christ, that means if we are being obedient unto his word, then that means we are abiding in him. Amen? Amen. And I didn't say that, church. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. Because in the book of John, chapter 15, Jesus, speaking to the disciples, he let them know. He said that he was the true vine and that the father is the husband man, which is the one who does the pruning. But he says that we are the branches. And then he goes on to let us know. He said, abide in me and I in you as the branch which is us, cannot bear fruit of ourself except it abide in the vine, which is Jesus. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Then verse number five, he says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. In other words, church, if we want to be, to be able to keep our promises, if we want to be a new creature, a new creation, in order to have a new beginning, we have to abide in Christ. But guess what? Christ also wants to abide in us. He says, abide in me and I in you. So Christ wants to abide in you. In fact, he wants to abide in us so much that he even prayed to abide in us. Two chapters later, in John chapter 17, we find Jesus speaking to the Father. In fact, he's praying to God, and he is praying for the disciples he starts out praying for the disciples because Jesus knows what he's about to go through, Elder Don. He knows what he's about to go through. So he starts praying for the disciples. Hope, oh, did anybody catch that? Jesus, knowing what he's about to go through, go to the cross and to suffer. But instead, he's praying for the disciples. What's that telling us, church? That in this new beginning, in this new creation, that we will be going through some things, but we got to consider others. We've got to pray for others. Jesus prayed for the disciples. In fact, it got to a point where he asked the Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. 
He wanted him to set them apart by the word. But then, church, this is what I want us to get to. After he prayed for the disciples, he prayed for you and me. He prayed for us. After praying for the disciples in verse number 20 of John chapter 17, Jesus says, Neither pray I for these alone, these alone being the disciples, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, through the disciples' word. So in other words, church, Jesus was praying for you. He was praying for me because we believe on him through the word of his disciples. He says that they may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. He wants us to be one, church. He wants us to abide in him and he wants to abide in us that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I've given them, that they may be one even as we are one. Listen to this, church. I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. Church, it is an awesome thing to be in Christ, but it's even a greater thing for Christ to be in us for us to abide in him and for him to abide in us, not only is it awesome, but guess what, church? It is a great advantage. But even though we have that advantage of Christ praying for us, even though we have that advantage of Christ dwelling within us, even though we have that advantage of him abiding in us and we abiding in him, nobody told me when I accepted him in my life, that this road would be easy. So that means even with Christ dwelling within us, we're going to have some moments where we struggle, church. Or maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only one who's having struggling problems. Because I'm going to let you know, church, every moment of every day, I am sorry, but Brother Bobby does not always think what Brother Bobby's supposed to be thinking about. Every moment of every day, I'm sorry, Brother Bobby is not talking like Brother Bobby's supposed to talk. I may say some words that I shouldn't have said. The other night I got up and I was going to the bathroom and instead of me doing what I should do, turn on the light, I want to try to stumble through the dark and when I hit my toe, believe me, I uttered a word that should not have uttered. Or maybe sometimes throughout the day, I'm sorry, Elder Don, Brother Bobby may not do what he's supposed to do. But then maybe it's just me. But so let me flip the coin a little bit. Maybe someone out there can understand this. Sometimes it's not what we do, it's what we don't do. So maybe somebody out there may not have thought a thought that they should have been thinking. The Bible tells us what to think. It says, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things that are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, I just ask that, have we been thinking those type of thoughts throughout this week? Or, or, or maybe we, we didn't say a word that we should have said. Maybe someone might have mentioned that they were struggling. And instead of you saying, God bless you, can I have a moment to pray with you? You just kept it moving. Or, or, or maybe, maybe it was an act that you should have done, but you didn't do. Maybe you were riding down the road and maybe there was a beggar standing in the medium holding up a sign saying, lost my job, I got three kids, will you help? And while you sitting there at the stoplight, instead of rolling down your window, you just drove on by. So I'm just here to say that even though 
Christ is in me and I am in him. There's some times, church, where Brother Bobby struggles. But see, that's normal. I realized because I used to beat myself up until I understood what Paul wrote. Go with me, church, to Romans chapter 8, verse 6 through 10. And Paul wrote this, to be carnally minded or fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind, the fleshly mind is enmity, which is the enemy against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, to the word of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh, listen to this, cannot please God. So those moments that I be in, I'm not pleasing God. But thank goodness we have a merciful God. It goes on to say, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, if Christ be in you, listen to this, church. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. In other words, church, there's some times, church, where that old man, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Passed away. We sometimes associate that with death. But there's a lot of times with that old man that is in me seems to resurrect himself. Or I bring him back up. I don't mean to. I don't intend to. But it seems like it happens. And I'm going to tell you this, church. It troubled me until I understood what Paul said one chapter earlier, in Romans chapter 7, verse number 19 and 20, and I love the way that Paul wrote this. He said, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. There's no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me. In other words, church, sometimes I want to do good. I want to give that man on the road something, but sometimes I just don't. Sometimes I want to say, can we go somewhere and pray? Oh, God bless you. But there are moments in my mind in which I really don't intend to, but I don't. But I thank you, God, that we have a loving and merciful God. And so I'm just letting you know, church, that even though this new creation, this new creature, this new beginning, and even though God, Christ is in us and we are abiding in him, and even though he's praying for us, Nobody says that this road is going to be easy. But we've got to learn this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. We have to leave that old man dead. All things are passed away. Let me ask you this, church. When God gives you a new beginning, it starts with what? When God gives you a new beginning, it starts with what? I know we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. So in other words, when God gives us a new beginning... It has to start with an ending. It has to start with an ending. It has to start with that old man being put to death. In other words, those old things that we used to do, we shouldn't do them anymore. We've got to take off that old man in order to walk in this new beginning. <clears throat> I'm thinking about John. In the book of John, there's a story in chapter 11 about a man by the name of Lazarus. I'm quite sure most of you are familiar with Lazarus. Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary, very, very good friends of Jesus. And while Jesus was away one time, Lazarus got a little bit sick. And Martha and Mary sent word to Jesus that their friend, the one whom he loved, was sick. But Jesus failed to come. And then it got to a point where his sickness turned into death. And then finally, Jesus decided to make his way to see them. And when he got there, 
Mary and Martha, they were telling him, Lord, had you been here, our brother would not have died. And Jesus let them know, do you know that you will see your brother again? And they said, yes, we will see him in the resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And then Jesus proceeded to tell them to take him to the grave site. And when they took him to the grave site, I understand this. They took him to a cave and there was a stone placed in front of the cave. And Jesus gave them instructions, roll away the stone. I want you to take that church. I want to say that again. There was a stone in front of the cave and Jesus instructed them to roll away the stone. I want you to put that on the sticky side of your brain. Um, We're going to comment on that in a little bit, okay? But then afterwards, when they rolled away the stone, Jesus called out and said, Lazarus, come forth. And he called Lazarus by name because had he not called Lazarus by name, anyone in that, in that grave site, that was in Christ, that believed in Jesus, they would have came forth because they would have recognized that voice. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And the scriptures tell me that Lazarus came forth. He was bound in grave clothes. He had a napkin on his head. He couldn't see, but he was coming forth. Then Jesus gave them instructions. John chapter 11, verse 44 He said, and he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go. What I'm trying to say this, church, when Jesus called Lazarus forth, Lazarus was starting a new beginning, a life after being dead. But he was struggling in his walk. He had the grave clothes still wrapped around him. He had the napkin on his face where he couldn't see. And Jesus said, remove him, loose him. So they took off the bandages. They took off the napkin so he could walk a little better, so he could see a little better in his new beginning. What I'm trying to tell you this, church, in your your new beginning, Jesus will place some people in your life that will help you along the way in this new beginning. Ah, maybe somebody ain't get it yet, Elder Don. So let me ask you to go back to the sticky side of your brain and peel that off. Earlier, I said that Jesus, when he got to the grave site, he asked them to roll away the stone. Had they not rolled away that stone, then Lazarus would not have been able to come out of there. So Jesus will place some people in your life to help you in this new beginning, to help you in this new walk. And right now today, church, I want to take this opportunity to thank Pasadena Seventh-day Adventist Church for helping me to take the grave clothes off, for taking the napkin off my face, for helping to roll away the stone. Because approximately two and a half years ago, I was released from prison and starting a new beginning after 32 years of being in prison, starting a new beginning out in a world that I've been away from for three decades. But this church... This church released those bandages. This church helped take that napkin off. This church helped roll away that stone that I can start this new beginning. God placed them in my life for a reason, and I thank God for this church. I thank God for Elder Don. I thank God for Elder Russell. I thank God for Sister Sharon, Sister Kat, El- Sister Ellen. I thank God for Brother Eric, Brother Gerd. I thank God for this body of Christ. Because when you start your new beginning, God will place some people in your life to help you on that journey. Amen. Amen. But I'm here today to tell you this, church. A lot of us don't want to put off that old man. We don't want to stop doing that old stuff we used to do because we got so accustomed to eating what we want to eat. We got so accustomed to drinking what we want to drink. We got so accustomed to doing what we used to do. But let me tell you this, if we go back to that old stuff, 
We need to, re we will be resurrecting that old man and we don't need to resurrect that old man. But when God gives you a new beginning, church, when God gives you a new beginning, don't repeat the old mistakes. When God gives you a new beginning, don't repeat the old mistakes. I'm reminded of a time in John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, we find Jesus, and he's in Jerusalem, and the feast of the Jews, and he's at a place called the Sheep Market. And near the sheep market, Elder Don, is a pool there called the Pool of Bethesda. And at that pool, it's a big, large pool, almost a football field long. And I'm telling you, it's a beautiful pool with five porches and overlays and everything. But what was around that pool was not a pretty sight. You see, around that pool, there were people that were crippled. There were impotent folks, there were blind folks, there were handicapped folks, all laying around the pool, waiting, waiting for something to happen. You see, it was, I want to say a myth back then, that when an angel came down and troubled the water, that the first person that got into that pool, <laughs> they would be healed. And when I read that, I really, I really couldn't grasp that because I said, I'm sorry, that's not my God. My God does not operate like that. My God doesn't operate. That reminds me, church, that reminds me of a game that I used to play when I was a kid. And, and I'm going to ask my, my great niece and great nephew, Janaya, can you come forward, come up here? Uh, Zay Zay, can you come forward, Elder Don? And I'm going to ask them to assist me for a minute. Because I'm going to tell you, my God doesn't operate like this, church. Okay. I want to know, when we were children, did we ever play that game called musical chairs? Amen. So my, my great niece and great nephew here, they're going to help me with this, okay? I want y'all to play the musical chairs, okay? When the music plays, y'all walk around. And when the music stops, you sit down, okay? All right. Hey, Elder Don, walk around. Keep walking when I drop my hand. Keep walking. Oh. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can go back and sit down. Thank you. You see, church, what I'm trying to say is I don't believe my God plays musical chairs with us. I don't think that he has his hand up watching people around the pool and that at a moment he points to an angel and an angel goes down and troubles the water and then the first person that gets in gets healed. I'm sorry. That's not the God that I serve. My God doesn't operate like that. But while Jesus was there, the scriptures tell me that he went and he saw a man who had an infirmity of 38 years. In other words, he was crippled for 38 years. He was lying on his bed. And Jesus asked him a question, church. He said, will thou be made whole? Now, if someone were to ask me that question, I would say, yes, I want to be made whole. Yes, please make me whole. But no, the man didn't say that. The man said, well, when the pool, if it, when it gets troubled, I have no one to push me in. Jesus didn't ask him that. So Jesus just simply told him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And the man rose up, took his bed, and he started to walk. Now, I want you to understand this, church, that that man was being obedient to what Jesus said. And he, and he was rejoicing in his blessing. And don't you know that if someone gets healed, that we should all be rejoicing? Because we're church folk. We're supposed to rejoice. But let me tell you this. I mentioned to you earlier that God will place some people in your life in this new beginning that will help you along the way. But there will also be some people in your life that will try to hinder you from this new beginning. Because as that man was walking, the scripture tells me that some Jews came to him and they questioned him. They confronted him. They said, why are you walking with your bed, carrying your bed, 
Don't you know to, today is the Sabbath day and you are not supposed to be carrying your bed on the Sabbath? And that man told him exactly what Jesus said. He said, the one who healed me, he instructed me to take up my bed and walk. So in other words, when you get opposition, when you're on your new beginning, you just be obedient to what Christ has told you. Amen? Later on, Jesus ran into that gentleman in the temple. And remember what I said, church. A lot of us don't want to let go of that old stuff. But when God gives you a new beginning, don't repeat the same mistakes. Jesus said it this way. When he found that man in the temple, Jesus afterwards, Jesus finding him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Now, church, when I looked at that, I said, is Jesus telling this man who's just been healed not to sin anymore? Now, I know I've been delivered. God delivered me. He delivered me from 32 years, blessed me with a family, and I'm struggling in this new beginning walk. And I know he's telling me don't sin no more. And I believe that when he was telling this man to sin no more, I'm thinking, church, and this is, this is Brother Bobby, I'm thinking he's not telling this man don't commit no more sin. I believe he was telling this man that sin that caused you to be in that situation for those 38 years, don't commit that sin anymore. I believe in Proverbs, it tells us that when we do that, we're like a dog returning back to our vomit. And he's telling him, don't do that anymore because if you do a worse, a thing is going to come upon you. So whatever sin that was that had that man crippled for 38 years, Jesus was saying, don't do it again. Now, I said earlier that, therefore, if any man be in Christ or woman, he's a new creature. So Jesus not only said that to a male, <coughs> but he also said it to a woman. He said it to a woman. In John chapter 8, three chapters later, I believe Jesus was just out and about, Don, like he normally does. And all of a sudden, a crowd of people come to Jesus and they bring with them a woman who they say is caught in adultery. And they tell Jesus this. They said, Moses' law says that she should be stoned. What do you say, Jesus? Now, I'm going to give it to you in Brother Bobby's version, if you don't mind, church. I believe that Jesus, he stooped down on the ground and he began to write as the scripture said. And I believe that Jesus never looked up, but he looked around and he saw the shadows of the people and they were holding up rocks. And Jesus began to write. And the more he wrote, he started hearing rocks fall to the ground. And so he began to write even more and more rocks fell to the ground. And as Jesus began to write even more, the shadows that were around him began to get fewer and fewer. And he wrote a little more, and the shadows that were around him began to get fewer and fewer. Until finally, Jesus looked, and there was only one shadow in the ground. And when Jesus looked up, he saw that it was the woman. And he asked that woman, he said, woman, where are your accusers? And in John chapter 8, verse number 11, the woman said, she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, after Jesus asked her, who condemneth thee? She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. But listen to what he told her. He said, go and sin no more. Now, was he telling this woman, church, for the rest of her life not to commit any more sin? Well, he could have. But I think that Jesus was telling this woman that whatever sin it was that had those men to bring you here to go and sin no more, commit that sin no more. Now, I'm saying this, church, because there are a lot of times when we make promises 
There are a lot of times when we make resolutions. There are a lot of times when we start a new beginning. It's hard for us to put off that old man. I know, I know, I, I, I used to love ice cream. I did, I'm sorry. I used to love ice cream, butter, pecan, yes. I used to love ice cream. In fact, when me and my sister go to the store, I always got over there, <clears throat> got some butter, pecan. I, I had, but I realized that I like butter pecan, but butter pecan didn't like me. So I had to cut back on the butter pecan until I eventually cut butter pecan out. But I had to know that I cannot go back because when God gives you a new beginning, don't repeat the old mistakes. Because of this, church, if you continue to do as you did, you will continue to get what you got. Let me say that again. If you continue to do what you did, you will continue to get what you got. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation, a new beginning. Old things are passed away. We've got to leave that old man dead. We can't let him resurrect. We cannot make the same mistakes because if we continue to do as we did, we will continue to get what we got. Because this church, in order for us to get something new, we got to do something different. We want that new beginning. We want that be that new creation. We want to be that new creature. So in order for us to get something that we never had, we've got to do something different, Elder Dom. We've got to do something different. And sometimes, church, sometimes, when we do something different, when we do something new, it sometimes calls for us to step into the unknown which may feel uncomfortable and sometimes frightening for us. Sometimes when we are to do a new thing, a new beginning, it calls for us to step into the unknown, something we've never done before. And it, at that moment, it's going to feel uncomfortable because guess what? We haven't done this before. In order for us to get comfortable, we first have to be uncomfortable. In order for us to get comfortable, we first have to get uncomfortable. Then the more we proceed, the more we continue to step, then we, it will become comfortable to us. I recall a man by the name of Peter in the book of Matthew. In the book of Matthew chapter 14, Jesus was with the disciples and he decided, okay, uh, I'm going to send y'all on y'all way. I'm going to take a break and go up into the mountains and commune with the Father. Now, I, I just want to say this, church. If Jesus takes time to commune with God, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we? So sometimes we need to send people away to send them about their business for a moment and for us to commune with God. So Jesus goes into the mountains, he communes with God, and then at nighttime, Jesus begins to proceed to where the disciples are. Now, the disciples are in a boat, and they're traveling on water. So Jesus, instead of getting in a boat, Jesus decides to walk on water. And he's walking on water towards the disciples. Disciples, they look out of the boat, and just imagine if you was a disciple. And you saw Jesus, or what you thought was Jesus walking on, on water. You probably said, oh, is that him or is that a spirit? What is that? And so Peter asks a question. <laughs> I love Peter. Because Peter asks questions that I sometimes say, wow, he sounds something like me. Because I know that when I be studying God's word and reading God's word, I ask God some questions. And I know God be looking down and say, really? Really? Peter asked a question. He said, Lord, if that be you, bid me to come. Now think about that question. Jesus already told him, do not be afraid, it is me. So Peter said, Lord, if that be you, bid me to come. So what was Jesus going to tell Peter? No, it's not me, Peter. Stay in the boat. So he tells Peter to come. And so Peter steps out 
on water. He steps out on something that he is not familiar with, something that is new to him. You see, Peter, when he's used to walking, he's used to feeling sand in between his toes. He's used to walking on solid ground, maybe in his sandals. But now he's walking on liquid. He's walking on water. This is something new to him, something uncomfortable to him. But he kept his focus at the beginning on Jesus. Then when he began to walk even more, and when the scripture says when the winds got boisterous and the waves got even bigger, it says he took his focus off of Jesus and he began to sink. What am I saying, church? I'm saying that in order for us to continue in this new beginning, in order for us to be able to keep that promise in order for us to be able to keep that resolution, we've got to stay focused on Jesus. Even in those things that become new to us, those things that we sometimes are not accustomed to because they are new to us. The scripture says this, but straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if thou... If it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on water, starting his new beginning to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, Wherefore didst thou doubt? In other words, church, in this new beginning, in this walk, we're going to have some times where we're uncomfortable. We're going to have some things that we're not familiar with. And as long as we stay focused on Jesus. But the key is this. If we do for a moment take our focus off Jesus and we begin to sink, he's still right there ready to save you. Amen. Our God is an awesome God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And because of this, we know that we can expect God to do some great things in our life. We can expect God to do some great things in our life. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 18 and 19, the word of God says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. In other words, church, we got to leave those old things behind. We have to leave those old things behind. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, and they were in the wilderness. And when they got hungry and wanted to eat, they began to murmur against Moses. The scripture tells me that they had the nerve to tell Moses, we remember the leeks and the onions that we used to eat in Egypt. You see, they remember what they ate, but they forgot the slavery that they were in. Sometimes when we start something new, we remember the good times of the old but we don't remember the reason why we left that old time. So it says, remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. And considering those things of old, church, I want you to know this, that in this walk, sometimes we're going to make some mistakes. In this new beginning, we're going to make some mistakes. But do not allow those past failures to cripple you or handicap you from continuing on in your new beginning. Come on, it didn't stop David when he was suffering from his pride when he went and got Bathsheba. When he could have had anyone else, he decided to take another man's wife, but that didn't stop him from continuing on with the Lord. That didn't stop Moses, did it? When he had his disobedience moment, remember God told him the second time to speak to the rock, but he decided to strike the rock, but he continued on with the Lord. It did not stop Goliath, did he? When he had his lust for many different women that were not with God, but it tells me, church, that even in his last moment, with his eyes out and chained to some pillars in the temple, that when he pulled those pillars down, he destroyed more Philistines then than in any battle. 
It didn't stop Peter, did it? When he had his moment of denial, when he denied Christ, not once, not twice, but three times. So I'm letting you know this church on this walk, we're going to make some mistakes, but don't, don't allow past failures to end your journey, amen? Because God is looking to do a great thing with you in this new beginning. And some of us in our lives have already seen him do that great thing. Come on, Brother Irk, come on, you can testify to the fact that you never imagined God would have you in this situation when you got baptized. Brother Garrett, you can't imagine that God would have you doing what you're doing. Come on, Sister Sharon, you can testify to the fact when you first started this walk, you never thought that God would have you doing this great work that you do for the Lord, for this church. I'm telling you, church, I'm telling you, God is looking to do some great things for us. You know why? Because the Bible lets us know that that's what he is. He's an awesome God and he does great things. In verse number 19, it says, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall bring forth. Ye shall not know it. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Let me read that again. Behold, I will do a new thing. Anybody looking for him to do a new thing in your life today? He said, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. In other words, church, it's coming. It's springing forth. All you got to do is continue on in this journey. Shall ye not know it? He says this. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 and 5. Verse 3 says, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for God. In other words, I just like to say it like this. Are there any modern day John the Baptist in the house today? Are there anybody, is there anybody out there preparing the way for the Lord? We just mentioned earlier, we just mentioned that we want to pray for the Lord's soon return. And John the Baptist prepared the way for the Lord's return, for the Lord to come. So we want to be the modern day John the Baptist to prepare his way to come, to tell others about the goodness of the Lord. Because the Lord is looking to do a great thing. I, I love this verse, that's why I went back to it. It says, I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You see, church, I'm reminded of this. <laughs> when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they came out and they began to be in the wilderness and they started journeying. And then all of a sudden, the scripture tells me that that rascal Pharaoh, Pharaoh realized he made a mistake. He said, hold up, we need them people back. So he mounted up and he took his army and he pursued them. Now, while he was pursuing them, the children of Israel was moving towards the Red Sea. And when they got there, all of a sudden the water was there. They couldn't go any further. Behind them was the Egyptians pressing up on them. And they began to do as they always do. Come on. When something goes wrong in the church, what they do? Murmur against the leadership. So they murmured against Moses. And they said, what, you brought us out here to die? So God instructed Moses to do what? We all know the story. Told Moses to stretch forth his rod. And that same thing that was hindering them, the water, that same barrier, God split that, rose it up on walls. Walls of water. The ground was dry, and the children of Israel walked through on dry ground. When the Egyptians tried to pursue, the water came down and flooded them. Not only will God remove your barriers, but he'll turn your barriers into blessings. He will turn your barriers into blessings. How do I know this? It says, I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. In other words, when they had gotten on the other side, when they were in the desert, when they got, you know, desert is dry ground. There's no water there. So they're a little thirsty. So what did they do? Like they always do, murmur against the leadership. So they go to Moses and say, would you bring us out here to die of thirst? So God instructed Moses to strike the rock and to bring forth what? 
bring forth the very thing that was hindering them from getting to the promised land. He brought forth water out of a rock. In other words, that barrier that was hindering them from getting to the promised land, he used that same thing, that barrier, as a blessing to bless them. In other words, church, what I'm trying to tell you is this. In this new beginning, in this walk, God will remove some things out your life, but then he will take those things and turn them into a blessing for you. He's looking to do a great thing for you. He's looking to do a new thing for you. All you have to do is abide in him and he in you. The scripture says once again, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, Jesus wants to do a new thing. And he says, and he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, write, for these words are true and faithful. If anyone here today is wanting and willing to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, then you too can have a new beginning. Maybe there's someone that made a promise to the Lord on January the 1st. And maybe here on January the 28th, You've fallen short on that promise, and you might want to renew that with Christ. If you want to, you can speak to him now. Maybe someone has not even started that walk, but they're tired of their lives being upset. They're tired of their lives being turned to mist and upside down. Earlier, I asked Elder Jerry to give me a cup of water, and I know Elder Jerry thought that was unusual because he probably saying that, but Bobby, you don't usually drink water while you up there, and I, I usually don't. But see, I realized something. Earlier, I, I, I was sick a few weeks ago, and I thank the church for the, the blessings and the prayers that they uttered up for me. But I decided to try something new. Uh, there's an old thing that used to, I used to take when my stomach was upset, church. It's called Alka-Seltzer. Alka-Seltzer is a remedy that helps your upset stomach, but now they even have it where it helps you if you have a cold. And back in the day, Alka-Seltzer had a thing, a slogan called, Flop, Flop, Fizz, Fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. And the thing with Alka-Seltzer, all you do is take two tablets of water, since I got a little bit of water, I'm only going to drop one, and you get a, like a bubbling effect, like a volcanic effect. And back in the day, it helps upset stomachs. Well, church, so it is in the natural, so it also is in the spiritual. Some of us today have some upset lives. We've got some upset minds. We've got some things troubling us, people troubling us. We've got upset situations and family things that are going on in our life. Well, I'm letting you know that you are the water and Jesus is the Alka-Seltzer. He says, abide in me and I in you. And when he drops into your life, when he drops into your life, your upset life will become even better. He will heal you. See, why? Because he wants you to know this, not flop, flop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is, but flop, flop, fizz, fizz, oh, how good God is. So if anyone, anyone is desiring a walk with Jesus and you want to make sure you keep that promise, keep that resolution, remember, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Off with the old, on with the new, a new beginning. Amen? Amen. I leave you as I came, giving all praise, glory, and honor to our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen?